Hey guys, sorry I can't read live to you today. Um, I have a doctor's appointment, so those occur a lot on Fridays for me. But anyway, uh, we've got to get through this book before the end of the year. So I know we only have a few weeks left, and we've got about half of this book left. Um, we're on chapter 8. So what I may have to do is do a few recordings and you guys might get to listen to some of this book on the days that I don't get to read or um, on days that are not Fridays. So I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can get through as much as possible. I really miss seeing your smiling faces today. It's not as much fun reading when there's really no one listening. So. Anyway, here we go. The Phantom Toll Booth. Let's see what's going on with Milo this time. Chapter 8 The Humbug Volunteers. Couldn't eat another thing, puffed the Duke, clutching his stomach. Oh my, oh dear, agreed the minister, breathing with great difficulty. Mm, mumbled the Earl desperately trying to swallow another mouthful. Thoroughly stuffed, sighed the Count, loosening his belt. Full up, grunted the undersecretary, reaching for the last cake. As everyone finished, the only sounds to be heard were the creaking chairs, the pushing of plates, the licking of spoons, and of course a few words from the humbug. A delightful repast, delicately prepared and elegantly served, he announced to no one in particular. A feast of rare bouquet, my compliments to the chef. By all means, my compliments to the chef. Then, with a most distressed look on his face, he turned to Milo and gasped. Would you kindly fetch me a glass of water? I seem to have a touch of indigestion. Perhaps you've eaten too much too quickly, Milo remarked sympathetically. Too much too quickly, too much too quickly, wheezed the uncomfortable bug between gulps. To be sure to be too much too quickly. I most certainly should have eaten too little too slowly, or too much too slowly, or too little too quickly, or taken all day to eat nothing, or eaten everything in no time at all, or occasionally eaten something any time, or perhaps I should have. And he toppled back, exhausted, into his chair, and continued to mumble indistinctly. Attention, let me have your attention, insisted the king. Leaping to his feet and pounding the table, the command was entirely unnecessary. For the moment he began to speak, everyone but Milo, Talk, and the distraught bug rushed from the hall, down the stairs, and out of the palace. Loyal subjects and friends, continued Azaz, his voice echoing in the almost empty room. Once again, on this gala occasion, we have. Pardon me, uh, coughed Milo as politely as possible, but everyone has gone. I was hoping no one would notice, said the king sadly. It happens every time. They've all gone to dinner, announced the humbug. Weekly. And just as soon as I catch my breath, I shall join them. That's ridiculous. How can they eat dinner right after a banquet? asked Milo. Scandalous, shouted the king. We'll put a stop to it at once. From now on, by royal command, everyone must eat dinner before the banquet. But that's just as bad, protested Milo. You mean, just as good, corrected the humbug. Things which are equally bad are also equally good. Try to look at the bright side of things. I don't know which side of anything to look at, protested Milo. 
Everything is so confusing, and all your words only make things worse. How true, said the unhappy king, resting his regal chin on his loyal royal fist, as he thought fondly of the old days. There must be something we can do about it. Here's a little picture of Milo and Talk and the king. Pass a law, the humbug suggested brightly. We have almost as many laws as words, grumbled the king. Offer a reward, offered the bug again. The king shook his head and looked sadder and sadder. Send for help, drive a bargain, pull the switch, file a brief, lower the boom, tow the line, raise the bridge, bar the door, shouted the bug jumping up and down and waving his arms. Then he promptly sat as the king glanced furiously in his direction. Perhaps she might allow rhyme and reason to return, said Milo softly, for he had been waiting for just such an opportunity to suggest it. How nice that would be, said Azaz, straightening up and adjusting his crown. Even if they were a bother at times, things always went so well when they were here. As he spoke, he leaned back on the throne, clasped his hands behind his head, and stared thoughtfully at the ceiling. But I'm afraid it can't be done. Certainly not, it can't be done, repeated the humbug. Why not? asked Milo. Why not indeed, exclaimed the bug, who seemed equally at home on either side of the argument. Much too difficult, replied the king. Of course, emphasized the bug, much too difficult. You could if you really wanted to, insisted Milo. By all means, if you really wanted to, you could, the humbug agreed. How? asked Azaz, glaring at the bug. How? inquired Milo looking the same way. A simple task, began the humbug, suddenly wishing he were somewhere else. For a brave lad with a stout heart, a steadfast dog, and a serviceable small automobile. Go on, commanded the king. Yes, please, seconded Milo. All that he would have to do, continued the worried bug, is travel through the miles of harrowing and hazardous countryside, into unknown valleys and uncharted forests, past yawning chasms and trackless wastes, until he re reached Digitopolis, if, of course, he ever reached there. Then he would have to persuade the math magician to agree to release the little princesses, and, of course, He'd never agree to agree to anything that you agreed with. And anyway, if he did, you certainly wouldn't agree to it. From there, it's a simple matter of entering the mountains of ignorance, full of perilous pitfalls and ominous overtones, a land to which many venture but few return and whose evil demons slither slowly from peak to peak in search of prey. Then an effortless climb up 2,000-step circular stairway without railings in a high wind at night, for in those mountains it's always night, to the castle in the air. He paused momentarily for breath, then began again. After a pleasant chat with the princesses, all that remains is a leisurely ride back through those chaotic crags whose frightening fiends have sworn to tear any intruder limb from limb and devour him down to his belt buckle. And finally, after the long ride back, a triumphal parade, if, of course, there's anything left to parade, followed by hot chocolate and cookies for everyone. The humbug bowed low and sat down once again, very pleased with himself. I never realized it would be so simple, said the king, stroking his beard and smiling broadly.
quite simple indeed, concurred the bug. It sounds dangerous to me, said Milo. Most dangerous, most dangerous, mumbled the humbug, still trying to be in agreement with everybody. Who will make the journey? asked Talk, who had been listening very carefully to the humbug's description. A very good question, replied the king, but there is one far more serious problem. What is it? asked Milo, who was rather unhappy at the turn the conversation had taken. I'm afraid I can tell you that only when you return, cried the king, clapping his hands three times. As he did so, the waiters rushed back into the room and quickly cleared away the dishes, the silver, the tablecloth, the table, the chairs, the banquet hall, and the palace, leaving them all of a sudden standing in the marketplace. Of course you realize that I would like to make the trip myself, continued Azaz, striding across the square as if nothing had happened. But since it was your idea, you shall have all of the honor and fame. But you see, began Milo, Dictionopolis will always be grateful, my boy, interrupted the king, throwing one arm around Milo and patting talk with the other. You will face many dangers on your journey, but fear not, for I have brought you I have brought you this for your protection. He drew from inside his cape a small heavy box about the size of a school book and handed, handed it ceremoniously to Milo. In this box are all the words I know, he said. Most of them you will never need. Some of them you will use constantly. But with them, you may ask all the questions which have never been answered and answer all the questions which have never been asked. All the great books of the past and all the ones yet to come are made with these words. With them, there is no obstacle you cannot overcome. All you must learn to do is use them well and in the right places. Milo accepted the gift with thanks and the little group walked to the car still parked on the edge of the square. You will, of course, need a guide, said the king, and since he knows the obstacles so well, the humbug has cheerfully volunteered to accompany you. Now see here, cried the startled bug, for that was the last thing in the world he wanted to do. You will find him dependable, brave, resourceful, and loyal, continued Azaz. And the humbug was so overcome by the flattery that he quite forgot to object again. I'm sure he'll be a great help, cried Milo as they drove across the square. I hope so, thought Talk to himself, for he was far less sure. Good luck, good luck. Do be careful, shouted the king, and down the road they went. Milo and Talk wondered what strange adventures lay ahead. The humbug speculated on how he'd ever become involved in such a hazardous undertaking, and the crowd waved and cheered wildly, for while they didn't care at all about anyone arriving, they were always very pleased to see someone go. So, chapter nine. Okay, we can do this. It's a short chapter. It's all in how you look at things. Soon, all traces of Dictionopolis had vanished in the distance, and all those strange and unknown lands that had lay between the kingdom of words and the kingdom of numbers stretched before them. It was late afternoon, and the dark orange sun floated heavily over the distant mountains. A friendly, cool breeze slapped playfully at the car, and the long shadows stretched out lazily from the trees and bushes. Ah, the open road, exclaimed the humbug, breathing deeply, for he now seemed happily resigned to the trip. The spirit of adventure, the lure of the unknown, the thrill of the gallant quest. How very grand indeed. Then, pleased with himself, he folded his arms, sat back, and left it at that. In a few more minutes, they had left the open countryside and driven into a dense forest. 
This is the scenic route straight ahead to point of view, announced a rather large road sign, but contrary to its statement, all that could be seen were more trees. As the car rushed along, the trees grew thicker and taller and leafier, until, just as they'd hidden the sky completely, the forest abruptly ended and the road bent itself around a broad promontory. Stretching below to the left, the right, and straight ahead, as far as anyone could see, lay the rich green landscape through which they had been traveling. Remarkable view, announced the humbug, bouncing from the car, as if he were responsible for the whole thing. Isn't it beautiful? gasped Milo. Oh, I don't know, answered a strange voice. It's all in the way you look at things. I beg your pardon, said Milo, for he did not see who had spoken. I said it's all in how you look at things, repeated the voice. Milo turned around and found himself staring at two very neatly polished brown shoes. For standing directly in front of him, if you can use the word standing for anyone suspended in midair, was another boy just about his age, whose feet were easily three feet off the ground. Hmm. Interesting. For instance, continued the boy, if you happened to like deserts, you might not think this was beautiful at all. That's true, said the humbug, who did not like to contradict anyone whose feet were that far off the ground. For instance, said the boy again, if Christmas trees were people and people were Christmas trees, we'd all be chopped down, put up in the living room, covered with tinsels, while the trees opened our presents. What does that have to do with it? asked Milo. Nothing at all, he answered, but it's an interesting possibility, don't you think? How do you manage to stand up there? asked Milo, for this was the subject which most interested him. I was about to ask you a similar question, answered the boy, for you must be much older than you look to be standing on the ground. What do you mean? Milo asked. Well, said the boy, in my family, everyone is born in the air, with his head at exactly the height it's going to be when he's an adult. And then when we all grow toward the ground, when we're finally grown up, or as you can see, grown down, our feet finally touch. Of course, there are a few of us whose feet never reach the ground no matter how old we get, but I suppose that's the same in every family. He hopped a few steps in the air, skipped back to where he started, and then began again. And there's a picture of him. You certainly must be very old to have reached the ground already. Oh no, said Milo seriously. In my family, we all start on the ground and grow up. We never know how far until we actually get there. What a silly system, the boy laughed. Then your head keeps changing its height, and you always see things in a different way. Why, when you're 15, things won't look at all the way they were when you were 10, and at 20, everything will change again. I suppose so, replied Milo, for he had never really thought about that matter. We always see things from the same angle, the boy continued. It's much less trouble that way. Besides, it makes more sense to grow down and not up. When you're very young, you can never hurt yourself falling down if you're in midair. And you certainly can't get into trouble for scuffing up your shoes or marking the floor if there's nothing to scuff them on and the floor is three feet away. That's very true, thought Talk, who wondered how the dogs in the family liked the arrangement. But there are many other ways to look at things, remarked the boy. For instance, you had orange juice, boiled eggs, toast, and jam, and milk for breakfast, he said, turning to Milo. And you are always worried about people wasting time, he said to talk. And you are almost never right about anything, he said, pointing at the humbug. And when you are, it's usually an accident. 
A gross exaggeration, protested the furious bug, who didn't realize that so much was visible to the naked eye. Amazing, gasped Talk. How do you know all that, said Milo. Simple, he said proudly. I'm Alec Bings. I see through things. I can see whatever is inside, behind, around, covered by, or subsequent to anything else. In fact, the only thing I can't see is whatever happens to be right in front of my nose. Isn't that a little inconvenient? asked Milo, whose neck was becoming quite stiff from looking up. It is a little, replied Alec, but it's quite important to know what lies behind things and the family helps me take care of the rest. My father sees to things. My mother looks after things. My brother sees beyond things. My uncle sees the other side of every question. And my little sister Alice sees under things. How can she see under things if she's all the way up there? Growled the humbug. Well, added Alec, turning a neat cartwheel. Whatever she can't see under, she overlooks. Would it be possible for me to see something from up there? asked Milo politely. You could, said Alex, but only if you try very hard to look at things as an adult does. Milo tried as hard as he could, and as he did, his feet floated slowly off the ground until he was standing in the air next to Alec Bings. He looked around very quickly and an instant later he crashed back down to earth again. Interesting, wasn't it? asked Alec. Yes, it was, agreed Milo, rubbing his head and dusting himself off. But I think I'll continue to see things as a child. It's not so far to fall. A wise decision, at least for the time being. And Alec said, everyone should have his own point of view. Isn't this everyone's point of view? asked Talk, looking around curiously. Of course not, replied Alec, sitting himself down on nothing. It's only mine, and you certainly can't always look at things from someone else's point of view. For instance, from here it looks like a bucket of water, he said, pointing to a bucket of water. But from an ant's point of view, it's a vast ocean. From an elephant's it's just a cool drink, and to a fish, of course, it's home. So you see, the way you see things depends on a great deal on where you look at them from. Now come along and I'll show you the rest of the forest. He ran quickly through the air, stopping occasionally to beckon My Milo Talk and the humbug along, and they followed, as well as anyone who had to stay on the ground could. Does everyone here grow the way you do, puffed Milo when he had caught up? Almost everyone, replied Alec, and then he stopped a moment and thought. Now and then, though, someone does begin to grow differently. Instead of down, his feet grow up toward the sky. But we do our best to discourage awkward things like that. What happens to them, insisted Milo. Oddly enough, they often grow ten times the size of everyone else, said Alec thoughtfully and I've heard that they walk among the stars. And with that, he skipped off once again toward the waiting woods. Chapter 10 is called A Colorful Symphony. Let's see how many pages it is. Okay, this chapter is pretty long, so we're gonna have to stop there. Um, we're on chapter 10. We're just a little more than halfway through the book, so I'm probably going to do a few more recordings, plus I'll read to you on Fridays. Um, hopefully this will be this will be the last Friday that I hope that I have to miss reading to you guys, because I want to read to you as much as I can before summer gets here. I'm really going to miss this once school's out. I hope you guys are enjoying this book. I'm really liking it. Um, well, I hope you guys have a great weekend, and next week we will see what happens, um, where Alec is taking them and what they're going to find out. 
and hopefully they can bring rhyme and reason back. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Okay, guys, I've missed you. I will see you next week. Um, have a great weekend. Do something fun. Read some books with your parents or read a book to your parents or just sit quietly like I do and enjoy reading a book by yourself. But anyway, have a good weekend and I'll see you next time. Bye.